Okay. Welcome to Grab Bag Season 2, Episode 3. Contestants for tonight's show. No, well, sorry, that's the wrong introduction. I, I forgot where I was. Hmm. Oh, well. This is uh, Season 2. This is Episode 3. But it's going to be a little different than uh, what I told you at the end of the last lesson. I said that we would piggyback on lesson number two with a follow-up on lesson number three, but I've had a change of plans, and when I have a change of plans, that means that you have a change of plans, I guess, because, you know, <laughs> I'm the one doing the lesson. So, thanks for uh, joining in, and uh, what I'm going to do is I've decided I'm going to amplify the sermon that I'm going to preach this Sunday, but you are not going to actually get the release date on this grab bag until a week from this Sunday. So I will already have preached this sermon, well, two Sundays ago, because Terry will have preached the Sunday morning prior to the release of this lesson. You got all that? <laughs> I don't think I do. Um, so I'm going to do an amplification of that because it talks a little bit about politics and the election will be in two days from the release time of this or it may already have happened, I don't know. But I just hope that you'll still find it interesting. You know, when I, when I do a sermon, I'm very limited obviously of the amount of time that I have and I get a bunch of material and then I have to trim it down, edit it up cut things out and try to fit it into a time frame. And that was very difficult even for this sermon because when I have like a one and done sermon, which I have a lot of times, I don't have another week follow up to be able to jump back to the additional material. So I'm going to amplify this and then next week we'll pick up with uh, episode number four. We'll pick up what we're, what was supposed to be today. So the follow-up to episode number two. Woo! I messed myself up like that. It's nice that it's warm. If you've been gone with these uh, grab bags through the summer, you've seen the trees with leaves on them. And of course, just when I sit down to video, sounds like my neighbor's got a tractor out. So if it gets too loud, I'll <laughs> close the window. <clears throat> but um, I'm hoping that uh, this uh, that I'll be able to get through this with uh, the, the nice weather that's there, so that I don't have to stay inside. And hopefully, I'll do number episode number four uh, tomorrow or Friday. And after that, I don't know. It may be that the rest of the lessons will have to be inside because it'll get colder. Okay. Let me remind you, please, if you would, to if there's an opportunity for you to sign in and say that you watch this, um, won't you do that, please? Okay. So here we go. The sermon that I preached a week ago, or you know, at least a week ago, this last Sunday when this was released, I called dual citizenship. M maybe you have friends that have dual citizenship. In fact, maybe you have dual citizenship. I mentioned the fact that our missionary friends, they live in Italy, they have U.S. citizenship, and their children were born in Italy, and so by, through the parents, as well as through the fact that they were born in Italy, they have dual citizenship. They're citizens of the U.S., and they're citizens in Italy. It's nothing that they did, but it's just because of their birth and because of their parents. Well, Christians have dual citizenship. It's nothing that we do. It's as a result of our parents, and it's a result of um, our birth, and, and I'll explain that. Our dual citizenship is, is this. First of all, we're citizens of heaven. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 says that our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, 
the Lord Jesus Christ. John Denver, you know, you know, I'm showing my age here, but John Denver used to have a song called Rocky Mountain High. And in it, he talked about, he's a line that he's, he sang was, he's going home to a place he'd never been before. Now, when you think about going home, you think, no, home, me. <laughs> great, my phone ring. Um, home is a place that we were living in. And so usually a home is a place we left and we go back home. But uh, it's a great line going home to a place you'd never been before. That's the way it's going to be with us when it comes to heaven. You know, the song says, the world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. And so when we die, we're going to go home to a place that we've never been before because through Christ, we are citizens of heaven. So our citizenship in heaven has nothing to do with us. It just has to do with our rebirth. Secondly, we're citizens of the United States. You know, we're blessed by the king of our heavenly home to be part of the great USA. And we are truly blessed. And that has nothing to do with us. It has to do with our parents. Our parents were in the United States. They were either living here or they were citizens already. And so as a result of that, we're citizens of heaven citizens or of the United States. So we're citizens of heaven, citizens of the USA. I think that you would agree with me that our citizenship in the kingdom of God is to be valued over our U.S. citizenship. And that's, that's not to be anti-patriotic. It's just that we honor God above everyone else. The sovereign Lord is first over any earthly power or leader. You know, there are some who believe that the United States kind of equates to the kingdom of God. That behind God's throne in heaven, you know, is an American flag that's just waving. And they, they would believe that the end of the United States as, a, as an earthly power would somehow signal the end of the world and bring on the return of Jesus. But that isn't so. I mean, I would hate to see the end of the United States, and um, I, I don't know what evil would have to come about to what extreme for that to happen. But it wouldn't necessarily signal the end of the world or that Jesus was coming back. I'm sure people felt somewhat the same in Israel when their people wandered from God and, and God brought on uh, punishment, God brought on a necessary discipline by uh, having other nations come in and overrun them and take them off into captivity. Uh, you know, that may have felt like the end of the world to the nation of Israel. But the end didn't come. God preserved a remnant of his people. God has always had a remnant of his people. And there have been many nations that, well, I just think about England, for instance. You know, England started off as a godly nation. But through the years, it has become more secularized and Christianity is not a, a powerful force in England. And a lot of those people from England came over here, of course, and started the civilization in the United States that um, we recognize, you know, with the pilgrims and et cetera. And they, 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 they laid a Christian foundation while back home that nation was sinking. And they may have thought, wow, if England ever goes under if England ever becomes a non-Christian nation, that's going to be the end of the world. But it wasn't. God always has a remnant, and some of that remnant came over here to the United States and settled. So God always has his people. He has those who remain faithful to him. 
And if the United States goes the way of denying God, it may be that Jesus would return, but it also may be that God's going to plant a new revival in another country, and that remnant of people will grow and impact that country. See, allegiance to the kingdom of God is foremost for Christians. Like I said, we're citizens of heaven. We're citizens of the United States. But our citizenship in heaven is number one priority. It comes before our earthly allegiance. And we must, as citizens of heaven, hopefully, remain faithful to God and make an impact on our world. But it's God's kingdom, not the United States, it's God's kingdom that is eternal. And only the king of kings can give eternal life. And so that's why we have to stay attached to the vine. We have to make the kingdom of God our number one priority. And I'll mention later, not trust in chariots, as David said, not trust in armies and power and authorities and governments, but only trust in God. No earthly government, and we've learned this from history, no earthly government ha has a beginning, or I'm sorry, I messed that up, see? And we're not going back, we're just going to... Every earthly government, as we learn from history, has a beginning and has potential for an ending. Okay, did, did you get that? Every earthly government has a beginning and has potential for an ending. No earthly government can bring eternal security and peace to its people. None. As I just previously mentioned, David wrote, some trust in chariots, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. In Psalm chapter 2, <clears throat> we read, why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. <laughs> the Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. And it's just a song that speaks about the fact that the nations rage and the nations fight and the nations raise their fists saying that we're going to throw off God's shackles and we're not going to have anything to do with God. But God is so much higher and greater and stronger. And he gets angry and he scoffs and he laughs at the nations because they're doing, trying, attempting the impossible. These people who think they can defeat God are barking up the wrong tree, as they say. God is sovereign and over all, and our heavenly citizenship, therefore, is our most valued citizenship. I think you would agree with that. But I also think you would agree that our citizenship in God's kingdom does not mean disregarding political affairs in the United States. In other words, because we're citizens of heaven, we don't just turn our heads and ignore what's happening in the world, or particularly in our country. You know, there is a, a strong stink, if I can say it that way, of judgmentalism. When God's people snub as unimportant the political social issues that affect the lives of millions by making a deliberate choice to be heavenly minded and of no earthly good. In other words, I'm going to focus so much on heaven, and I don't care what happens down here. Let, let politics be whatever it is. Let, you know. United States Christians, that's you and I, 
live in a political society. And we have to flesh out our faith in that context. And Jesus sets that example. Because Jesus himself had dual citizenship. Jesus was a citizen of heaven. In fact, he was the owner manager, so to speak, who chose to also become a citizen on earth in the nation of Israel during the first century. And while living as a citizen in Israel, he, Jesus didn't live in an apolitical vacuum. Think about that. The Roman Empire, the Roman Empire was a political landlord with political rulers like the Caesars. And I'm not talking about the salad making Caesars. I'm talking about Julius and Augustus and you know, all of those Caesars, Caesar was a term for what we would, for instance, call our president, Caesar. And so they had political rulers like the Caesars in Rome and local rulers in different areas throughout their empire uh, with people like Pontius Pilate. We're familiar with him. But they also had corrupt kings like the Herods. You know, they had puppet kings that, that ruled on their behalf. Jewish tax collectors were despised. Why? Well, because they served a political empire, Rome, and they had a political job of taking money from Jewish citizens. So that was part of political the political society of the day. Not only that, anti-Roman religious political groups like the Pharisees, the Sadducees, you probably heard of those groups from the Bible, and so you think they're more religious, but they were also very political. You know, they were the ones that were in the Sanhedrin. They were the ones who were in authority over the people of, of Israel. So that was a political religious group. And there were others, less known ones, like the Zealots. You think of um, Simon the Zealot or Judas Iscariot, you know, the Zealots. These are the Antifa, if you would, of that day. And all of these political religious groups, along with the Roman domination and the, the Roman rulers, it just made it made Jerusalem like a volatile tinderbox. But that was the political ocean in which Jesus swam. And, and he was exposed to it, you might say, before his birth. Because why did Jesus' parents travel to Bethlehem? And, okay, time's up. Simply because a government ordered census came around saying that they had to return to their um, hometowns. And so Mary and Joseph left Nazareth and headed back to Bethlehem. See, Jesus was born into a political goulash that afflicted and affected him through his entire life. Now, if Jesus was not a political figure by choice, and he wasn't, he became a political figure once he stepped from the door of the carpenter shop onto the public stage in Israel. He, he knew he would become a political figure, and he did. He couldn't avoid it. He lived in a political world. You know, when a large portion of the general population, especially your closest friends and disciples, believe you have come to set up an earthly kingdom, even though you haven't. I mean, Jesus hadn't come to set up an earthly kingdom. And he stated in those uncertain terms that that wasn't his goal. 
But yet, when, like I said, when a, a large portion of the general population and your closest friends and disciples believe that you have, then you become a political figure by default. It's by default of the peoples. John wrote in chapter 12, they took palm branches and they went out to meet him shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Now those cries of kingship would have sounded to Roman and Jewish authority ears like a political statement for a new king who was holding a political rally, right? See, the politics of power pounded Jesus, and, and to some degree, Jesus even used it for his benefit. But consider the record, for instance, of Jesus' trial. After his arrest in Gethsemane, Jesus stood before Pilate and was questioned, are you a king? That's a political question. Eventually, Jesus told Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. To which Pilate responded, so you are a king. That's a political accusation. And when Pilate decided to release Jesus, calling him king of the Jews, the crowd shouted for the release of Barabbas, who was in prison for attempted political insurrection. Even at his trial, Jesus unintentionally became a pawn of the political scene. And I, I kind of say unintentionally tongue-in-cheek, because earlier I said, you know, Jesus could use the political environment. Uh, you know, Galatians 4.4 4 says that in the fullness of time, when the time was right, God sent his son. And God sent his son, we know, to be crucified. Well, how was he going to bring that about? He sent him at a particular time. I think when a lot, there were a lot, we don't have time to talk about all the things that were in place that were so strategic when Jesus came. But one of the things, I think, was the political scene. Because the political scene would be used to bring about Jesus' crucifixion. Jesus knew what was going to happen. You know, Jesus wasn't walking blindly into the end of his life, Jesus knew. You know, John 13, Jesus knew that his time had come for him to return to the Father. And he knew the means by which he would die. And the political situation helped to foment the societal factors necessary to bring about Jesus' death. And so we read about this idea that, you know, Jesus is involved, <laughs> I guess, in this political tug of war between the Jewish Pharisees and Sadducees and Pilate and, and the Roman government. And then, of course, King Herod and, and, and his, his deal. And Jesus is in the middle. Now, it just happened that Pilate didn't want Jesus to be killed. And so he attempted, if the scripture teaches, to appease the Jews by having Jesus beaten. And then he had Jesus brought out in a purple robe and wearing a crown of thorns. Now think about that. Those are politically themed mockeries. You see, there, there is so much about Jesus' life <laughs> that involved politics or political themes or political insinuations. Pilate offered again to release Jesus, and the, but the crowd coerced crucifixion through political blackmail. If you let this man go, you're no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. That's what they told Pilate. It's political blackmail. 
because Pilate can't appear to be not a friend of Caesar. Caesar is the one who has the power of life and death over him. Caesar is in charge of um, Pilate's political career. And so they blackmail Pilate with a political accusation. Well, John writes, it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Should I crucify your king, Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar. And that's a false political alliance. These are people who would never say Caesar is our king. But you know what they say, politics makes strange bedfellows. And because they're focused on getting Jesus, they're going to use political lies to accomplish their goal. For the chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write king of the Jews. Well, I need to back up. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, which was a political declaration. And the chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be king of the Jews. And Pilate answered, it's, all, it's almost like he's just fed up. What I've written, I've written. You know, I'm not messing with this anymore. This is done. I've written it. That's the way it is. Politics, politics, politics. Politics surrounded and dogged and affected and eventually afflicted Jesus in his ministry. Were politics ever mentioned in Jesus' teaching? Yes. For example, Jesus' answer in a discussion about paying taxes was that famous line, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Jesus recognized his dual citizenship. So you give to Caesar what's Caesar's and give to God what is God's. And there, his teachings about loving your enemies, you know, um, those, those loving their enemies included loving political and ethnic enemies, like they considered the Samaritans or the Gentiles to be. The parable that Jesus taught, the parable of the Good Samaritan, which, with, which most people are familiar it was a bold lesson when you get kind of like be between the lines. It was a bold lesson against political, ethnic discrimination. And it was in favor instead of compassion and love. Don't let these political differences, these ethnic differences separate us. Jesus was teaching that. Don't, don't let that happen. Instead, to have compassion and love, no matter who the person is, as far as their skin color or their background or their religious affiliation. By refusing, well, oh yeah, one of Jesus' premier teachings about servanthood was recorded in Mark chapter 10. And Jesus said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord their authority over you. So here's Jesus using a political example. He's going to show an alternative um, behavior that is more in line with God and with the kingdom of God. But he's going to show the alternative by, first of all, mentioning a political reality in their world that the rulers of the Gentiles lord their authority over you. And he says, but you be different. And you know that the greatest in the kingdom of God is the servant of all. So by refusing to endorse the political status quo with angry demonstrations like overturning the money-making business in the temple, and thus calling out the political leaders 
for a theocratic governmental fraud. I probably ought to explain what I'm saying there. You know, in Iran with the Muslim countries, they want to establish a theocracy where their religious law is the law of the land. Well, for the Jews, Israel was meant to be a theocracy where the the law of Moses, the, the, the law of God was the uh, overall rule in the land. And so when Jesus went into the temple and he angrily overturned the money-making business in the temple, what he was doing was calling out the political leaders for a theocratic governmental fraud. They were using the selling of these animals in the temple. They were giving it a, a theocratic, a godly face. But all it was was fraud. It was using God, the law of God, so to speak, um, to have people pay ex exorbitant and extorted prices for religious things that they were told they needed because the law of God said they needed it. I hope that makes sense. See, so when Jesus goes in and he upsets these tables, he is accusing the religious people of fraudulent, ungodly behavior. And when he does that, he's bucking at the same time the political system because the religious people were in charge of the political system, at least within the nation of Israel. So in word and in action, Jesus did make political statements throughout his entire ministry. It just underscores and endorses the fact that Jesus did not live in an apolitical vacuum. And it wasn't just Jesus, but it's also Old Testament and New Testament figures. I mean, we don't have a lot of time to go into detail here, but in the Old Testament, Daniel and his friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were forced into government service for King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon after being taken captive from Israel. Their moral resistance to Babylonian decrees are what landed Daniel in the lion's den and the three Jewish boys in the fiery furnace. It was all about politics and governmental allegiance versus their religion. They were living in uh, uh, an ungodly, not a God-based government. They were working in that government, but yet still they stood for God. What I'm just trying to illustrate, of course, is that politics and government were intertwined. We really can't get away from that in life. How about Joseph in Egypt? He was second to Pharaoh in the government. Same thing with Moses in Egypt. He goes in and says, God says, let my people go. That didn't sit very good with Pharaoh. But, you know, here's a guy who grew up in the Egyptian political system as an adopted son, so to speak, of Pharaoh. He goes away for 40 years to the land of Midian, and then he comes back and he begins to interact with that same political system. The story of Queen Esther is a politically based story. The judges of Israel, uh, to be a judge in Israel was a political slash religious position. Think about King David. I mean, the list goes on and on of God's people whose lives were intertwined with politics at home and in enemy governments. The prophets like Elijah and Jeremiah or Amos, you know, Terry did a sermon series from the book of Amos, and Amos was just a fig grower. 
But God called him to be a prophet and to bring a message, and it was a political message. Well, it was a godly message <laughs> addressing political injustices and governmental evils. And it's the same thing with Elijah and Jeremiah. God used them because of things he saw happening in the government that were unjust and were evil. You know, in the New Testament, John the Baptist was in prison because he got involved in a religious political squabble with King Herod by speaking against Herod having divorced his wife to unlawfully marry his sister-in-law. Well, John lost his head, figuratively, because he got really angry, and he confronted the royals with what they had done morally wrong according to God's law, and as a result, he lost his head physically as punishment for speaking against the royals. But that's just one New Testament example of faith and politics boom, colliding. One source I consulted stated that there are 36 political confrontations in the 22 chapters of the book of Acts alone. I, I can't say that uh, I've looked up every one of those, but I trust this source. 36 political confrontations in 22 chapters in the book of Acts. In fact, in Acts chapter 22 and 25, you just, if you're familiar with it, or you want to go and read it, you think about Paul playing his Roman citizenship as a get-out-of-jail-free card. Or he used his Roman citizenship to appeal to Caesar. It's what got him to Rome. It, it's the interaction of faith and politics. You know, Scripture tells us of godly people who live their lives for God in various political contexts. Can Christians today live void of politics? You know, <laughs> should we just, as they say, stick our heads in the sand and act like politics doesn't exist? Just ignore it all, especially with election coming up? Should we should we just ignore it all and say, well, whatever happens, happens. My vote doesn't count anyway. Well, I think you could tell from my little bit of sarcastic attitude that I don't agree with that. But, you know, there are a lot of people who think of politics like a definition I heard, gee, I don't know how many years ago. That politics, it, poly stands for many, and ticks are blood-sucking insects. That's why they feel about politics. It's just a bunch of blood-sucking insects. You know, should we avoid politics? Well, in, one, in a literal sense, really, you and I can't avoid being political because the word translated citizenship in Philippians 3.20, where it says our citizenship is in heaven, is the Greek word politumai. You can hear it, politumai. And technically, a citizen, or the Greek word for citizen is Politics. So you can hear politics in there. Politics. So by nature of being a citizen, according to the Greek, uh, you know, you are political. You can't run away from it. And the truth is that, like Jesus, we can't live without bumping up against politics. You know, civilizations impose political systems. And God's people have always had to interface with those political systems. Now, the first Sunday in November, which would be the Sunday after this video is released, is the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. We have brothers and sisters all around this world who, who are being martyred. They're being killed. They're their religious buildings are being uh, burned down. Uh, you know, Bibles are being confiscated. They're being imprisoned in jail for their faith. Because within the political system, for instance, in China or North Korea, it's illegal. 
you don't talk about being a Christian. They don't have the freedoms of religion like we do here in the United States. They have to live their faith inside their political system in the same way that we have to live our faith inside our political system. You just can't live anywhere without bumping up against politics. Because civilizations impose political systems. And all through history, people have always had to interface with politics. You know, even if you retreat like a hermit, you know, to some desert place or to a, a mountain hideaway, the fact is that there is some political agency that has jurisdiction over your desert or over your hideaway. So you can't escape politics. And that's what I was trying to illustrate with the, the greater part of this part, the first part of this lesson, is that Jesus, or the Old Testament people, Jesus, the Apostle Paul, the New Testament people, they lived in the political world. They knew they were dual citizens. They were citizens of heaven, yes, but they were also citizens of their countries, their empire, whatever, and wherever they lived on this earth. Preachers, and I know Terry said this about a month ago, I first heard it years ago from Bob Russell. Bob Russell said that the goal of preaching is to preach with the Bible in one hand and a newspaper in the other. Of course, nowadays it would be the Bible in one hand and an electronic device in the other. But the meaning of that statement is that it's the responsibility of the preacher or the Bible teacher to teach people how to interface with culture in the way that they live their faith. And that's, that's what Jesus was teaching that was what the <coughs> excuse me that's what the new testament letters are all about how do i live out flesh out my faith in this political system in the first century you, know, you read the letters of peter those were written to christians who are under extreme persecution and peter's teaching them how to keep looking heavenward because they have a heavenly citizenship but also how to live honorable, godly lives in their society that honors God, because they're dual citizens, citizens of heaven, but also citizens on this earth. And that's what we have to learn to do, not, not turn our backs and turn our faces and against politics, you know, snub our faces at all of those things, like I said earlier, bills and, and um, laws and stuff that affect millions of lives to just simply say in, in a kind of secondary way, you know, I don't really care about the fact that you're hungry. I don't care about social injustice. I, I don't care about any of that stuff. All I want, oh, I just know I'm a citizen of heaven and praise God. I'm just going to think about God all day and, and ignore all that stuff. God wouldn't want us to think that way. That's not the way that Jesus thought. God would want the opposite. He would want our heavenly citizenship to affect our earthly citizenship. And for us to do our best to bring light to darkness, to bring salt to the earth, so to speak, to bring righteousness and and the impact of love and compassion into this world. Not just simply to ignore people or their needs, or even to ignore God's purpose on earth. And that's what we're going to talk about here in this next section. As dual citizens living in our American political framework, I think the question we have to ask is, how can we heavenly residents imitate Jesus and benefit our earthly residents. 
Because I, I really honestly believe that's what God would want. He would want us asking, how can I make an impact for the kingdom of God? How can I, as an earthly resident, benefit my earthly residents and the people in my neighborhood, the people in my world? And so one question we need to ask is, how can we Christians strengthen our country in this turbulent political time? How can we bring value? Or how can we bring uh, not just value, but how can we bring behavior and thought and love and compassion that will benefit this world around us? How can we do that? And so, first of all, I think one thing that we can do is just to remember and to implement our mission. And I'm not talking about the mission of Norwin Christian Church, which is a restatement of Jesus' mission. You know, Norwin mission statement is to uh, reach out and teach all to follow Christ. Jesus said it this way, just go into all the world and make disciples. That's the overall mission that God wants to accomplish through the church, through you and me, on this earth. And it's not going to happen if we just ignore the culture and, the, and I would say the political um, environment around us. Psalm 33 says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Well, if we believe that truth then we've got to go make disciples. Because a nation is a nation whose God is the Lord when its citizens are citizens whose God is the Lord, right? And you can't have citizens whose God is the Lord if they're not disciples of Jesus. You know, we say that our heavenly citizenship is paramount, is, is most important, then the mission of God as a heavenly citizen is also paramount and most important. It is what God wants us to bring most into this world, to make disciples. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should be saved, all should be found, all should have eternal life. And that doesn't happen unless we get out there and interface with our society, with our world. See, our world, our world is a business world, a sports world, a pandemic world at the moment, an ethnic world, a racial world, a religious world, and yep, it's a political world. Like I said, this is the time that I'm recording this is actually, let's see, 12 days until the election, and it is very much a political world. Political signs scattered over everybody's roads, on every corner, political commercials, just you can't get away. It's a political world. But American Christians are commanded to go into all of those worlds, to preach the gospel, to live the gospel, of righteousness, even though it's scoffed at as intolerant and narrow-minded, even though Jesus is denounced as an egomaniac for claiming divinity and exclusivity as the only way to God and to becoming a citizen in heaven. We are commanded to go. And so like Jesus in his checks mix political scene, Let's love people despite their political affiliations. No government can solve the dilemmas of the heart and bring lasting hope. Only Jesus and grace can do that. So like Jesus, we must engage the world where it is, as it is, and obey the law of love. 
and make disciples of politicians and voters alike. So that's one thing that we, we need to remember to do is to implement our mission. The second thing, of course, is to pray, always pray. Second Chronicles 714, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. So it's a conditional statement. It was made to the nation of Israel. And it's not made to the United States. Uh, it's made to the church. It's made to the new Israel, which is the church. And so if we move this statement and translate this statement from the Old Testament into our world, this is the statement that God is speaking to us. And God is saying, you have a responsibility. Because if my people, that's you, if my people who are called by my name, that's you, if you will do this, you humble yourselves and you pray and you seek my face and you turn from your wicked ways. In other words, you repent of the sin that's in your life. If you, my children, my people will do that, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. It, you know, there is a lot that God wants to do through American Christians. <laughs> but sin is always a barrier. And it's not for us to be pointing at everybody else and saying, oh, those thinking political sinners over there, they would do this or that would do and vote for this and send this bill and do it. No. God doesn't put the onus or the responsibility on non-Christians. God says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. So prayer, repentant prayer, prayer for our nation, prayer seeking the face of God is something that we can bring to affect and influence our political society. And of course, Paul wrote to Timothy and said, I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people for kings and all those in authority. Not just a president, but for men in authority around the world. And men, not just who are, you know, not just a president, but for men and women who are in authoritative positions in, in your, on your school boards or in your civic organizations, in your county uh, political system kings and all those in authority that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. So remember your mission and implement your mission. Secondly, Christians, we need to pray. And a lot of people say, I do pray. And it's usually like, oh, God bless the president or, you know, God help the president or whatever. That's, that's, that's prayer. <laughs> But you, you know what I'm getting at. Okay, so thirdly, one thing we can do is we need to prioritize unity. In the church, we are spiritual siblings, but we are not twins or clones. The Bible doesn't teach that we should all agree on every political issue in our world. But the Bible does teach this. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Every effort. Politics should never be permitted to destroy unity among Christians between you and me. And as we turn our eyes upon Jesus, the old hymn goes, and look full in his wonderful face, political differences should be part of those things of earth that grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Jesus is not about tearing people apart and putting up walls and dividers, whether they be 
uh, ethnic or um, you know uh, religious oriented or political God isn't about separating people God is about reconciling people to himself and to each other we are Christians first and unity must prevail everybody doesn't have to think the way that I think in the church except on those things that are stated directly in scripture but everyone has freedom on issues that are not essentially stated in the scripture and so we must keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of the peace and make every effort to do that because satan will use things like politics to try and divide people in the church now a fourth thing and the final one i believe is that we need to vote as though we are citizens of heaven granted some of you are going to be uh, watching this after election day but there are election days coming up too uh, in the future and so uh, some of these principles I hope that you will remember now I do want to go to be totally honest here and to mention that I feel the first three things that I mentioned as far as implementing our mission and praying and making unity a top priority those are biblical mandates in other words those are things that the bible commands us to do but there is no direct command in the bible that says thou shalt vote but yet i strongly believe that there are biblical principles that lead us to participate in our society in very practical ways such as voting because what we're talking about here is as a church as christians how can we bring righteousness and how can we impact our world how can we encourage our world and things that are how can we bring salt to the earth how can we bring light into society the biblical principles that I'm speaking about led many godly men and women to carry their faith influence into the political arena in order to shine the light of the gospel. Were they conformed to each other in their political beliefs and affiliations? No way. Many, sometimes they were at odds with each other as far as their political alignment. Were they cloned, you know, in their religious beliefs? Every doctrinal iota uh, no were they remind were they united i mean in reminding citizen christians of their vital role in the survival of the united states absolutely you see they they believed that the faith in god that people had despite some religious doctrinal differences despite some um, differences in politics the faith that people had in God was essential to the sustaining and, and to the uh, strengthening and uh, the maintenance of the United States as a people and as an effective country for instance in his farewell address to the nation at the conclusion of his second term George Washington said, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to biblical prosperity, religion and morality are indisposable supports. You just can't go without religion and morality, he believed. His successor, John Adams, co-writer of the Constitution, wrote, this Constitution was made for a moral and religious people. And you know, he said further on, for anybody else, it's, it's just not, it won't work. For anybody who's not religious or moral, people like that, this constitution is of no effect. That's how valuable religion was to the nation and to carrying out the constitution. Engraved on the Jefferson Memorial was this quote 
God who gave us life gave us liberty. Can the liberties of a nation be secure when we have removed the conviction that these liberties are the gift of God? In other words, if we just come to the point that we don't think God exists and therefore can't give gifts or God exists, but this country or these liberties that we have are not a gift of God, you know, what then? Can a nation be secure, he asks. And of course, I think his inference is, no, it can't. Uh, decades ago, I met a man who was an elder in the Hillsboro Church of Christ in Hillsboro, Ohio. His name's Bob McEwen. And he eventually ran in the political arena and became a representative for Ohio in, for six terms in the Congress. And right now he's the head of the Council for National Policy in Washington, DC. So here's a guy who's carried his faith into the political arena because he wants to influence in a righteous, godly way what happens in our government. He is salt in that uh, corner of the earth. He is light in, in, in that area in which he serves on behalf of God. And Bob uh, McEwen wrote this, abandoning civic involvement, which is what a lot of people say Christians should do. But he says abandoning civic involvement would result in the disappearance of godly standards in our schools, communities, and nation. It would leave us with a generation that can't tell right from wrong or a girl from a guy. We have been entrusted, Bob wrote, to live and serve in the only nation that could put men on the moon and hear them read to all the world, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I mean, Bob heartily, heartily endorses the fact that Christians need to be involved and they need to act because God has called us to move into the world and make an impact. You know, uh, for there not to be any soul, for there not to be any light, you're just left with uh, tasteless and darkness. So uh, scripture teaches righteousness exalts a nation, but sin condemns any people. And so we're winding this down here. In light of what Bob McCune was saying, if we believe that righteousness exalts a nation, then we should exercise our responsibilities as U.S. citizen Christians and influence our country and its leadership through our righteous words and actions, bringing Christ-likeness and the fruit of the Spirit through civility to our spheres of influence. And I believe that one of those righteous actions that we can exercise is our right to vote. Because in the United States, we are given a voice to speak what we believe and to vote as we believe. It's a great opportunity to do something for, for God. Uh, countless you know, patriots have given some and some have given all to earn us the right to participate in our government. You know, Jesus did not teach directly, thou shalt vote, because in his society, there was no vote. But I think Jesus would have been at the polls voting and encouraging people in the kingdom of God to vote, to make a good and righteous impact through voting. Who do you believe as a leader will best defend the fatherless, the poor, the unborn, the least of these around the world, just as Jesus taught and exemplified? And if you believe that person will do the job, then pray and support that person, the person that you believe will seek and honor God. Because as we already heard, blessed is a nation whose God is the Lord. And so let's not surrender to apathy or anger. You know, my vote doesn't count. Why should I care? My vote won't matter at all. 
you know, it's been said, and it's true, that to remain silent is to speak. To do nothing is to do something. And to not vote is to vote. Many of us are familiar with Edmund Burke's conclusion that the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Burke also wrote this little tidbit of wisdom. He said, when bad men combine, when bad men get together, the good must associate, and the word associate, he meant, you know, older English, it meant get together. So when bad men combine, the good men must associate, or else they will fall one by one on unpitied sacrifice, an unpitied sacrifice in a contemptible struggle. If, if Christians don't get together and if Christians don't participate, if Christians don't speak and, and, and act in this world as a united body, then all that's necessary for darkness to win is for good men to do nothing. A prayed about purposeful Christian vote is a unique way to give to the United States what is the United States is while also giving to God what is God's? I'm a dual citizen. And so I honor my earthly citizenship by fulfilling my duty to vote. I give to the United States what is the United States. But yes, I also, I, yet I also honor my heavenly citizenship by seeking God's guidance in my voting choices and then by trusting God that no matter the outcome, that he will make my godly vote a contribution of light, love, and righteousness to this world. So I give to the United States what is the United States. I vote, I participate, I do what I can to serve people. But I also give to God what is God's. Because I vote, I participate, I give to the United States in the context of being a citizen of heaven. And with Christian thinking and with godly thought, I approach who I will support, who I will endorse, who I will vote for. In this way, I honor both of my citizenships. So thank you so much for uh, going through this class. And I hope that if there's a button on the bottom saying that you attended, that you watched, that you'll do that so that we have a record of that. Let me conclude just with a summary. We have dual citizenship in heaven and on earth. So let's be great stewards of both locations. We cannot escape the political realm around us. We can thank and honor God for his dual citizenship gift citizen of heaven and the gift of being a citizen of the United States. And we can thank God and honor him in four ways. Implementing our mission, go out and make disciples. Secondly, pray for our nation, those in authority, and not just in desperate political times, but always praying for our leaders and our authorities. Thirdly, keep church unity uppermost. Make every effort to preserve unity in the bond of peace. Every effort. Let nothing divide us, not our political um, Democrat, Republican, Independent. Those things should never divide us in the church. And then fourthly, like I said, the first three are godly mandates. The fourth one, I think the scripture would encourage, and that is to vote as God leads. Honor your earthly citizenship, but do it in the context of your heavenly, godly citizenship. 
okay, I hope that you made it through. And, you know, this is a one-sided kind of teaching, but you know where to find me. If uh, there's anything, I, I won't argue a bunch of stuff, anything that will separate. I, you know, I won't argue a bunch of politics, you know, to the death, that kind of thing, uh, because I will do what I can to love and to care for people above the political fray. But you know where to find me if you have any questions or anything you would like to uh, talk about. So uh, let me pray. God, this is uh, being recorded before the election. And uh, I don't know how deeply involved you get. Or if it's just kind of you want us to honor you and love you and you say, Men will make their choices and you allow free will. I don't know the degree of which you get involved and the degree to which you allow free will in the nations. But I pray, and I know many others do as well, that you would raise up leaders who would seek your face and who would honor you, that would lead our country um, to honor you. And uh, I pray, God, that your name would be lifted high. I pray that your people would repent and return to you and that we could become a nation that once again turns its face toward you and remains a nation that is blessed by you. As people have prayed, not just God bless America, but God may America bless you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Grace and peace to you all.